Hello everyone and welcome back to the Kenny Wallace Show brought to you by JEGS, the leader in high performance aftermarket car parts. Remember to go to JEGS.com for everything you need. Well, deep breath again. It's a new year. The very first conversation in the year 2024 is what I believe is the greatest race car driver that I've ever seen. And if you don't believe me, Tony Stewart said he's the best he's ever seen. Kyle Larson. Welcome, Kyle. Hey, how are you, Kenny? Man, I'm doing really good. But first of all, I got to tell you, behind you is absolutely beautiful. Are you in your home? Uh, yeah, we're at our house here in Arizona. We spend we spend the off season and in the first couple months of the NASCAR season um, out here enjoying some good weather and, and just some time away from racing and racing people and, and just try to kind of recharge out here. So, um, yeah, it's fun. We get the Christmas decorations up. They're coming down <laughs> in a couple of days and uh, do some golf. Owen just started flag football. Um, there's all sorts of things to do, you know, around here. So it's, it's fun. It's fun to kind of, like I said, get away and, and just uh, recharge a little bit. You know, like I tell everybody, I put a lot of work into this. Got all, all my notes ready to go. I always remind everybody I, I do my best to be prepared. But let's start right there. Uh, Jimmy Johnson, uh, our seven-time NASCAR champion, started doing that, you know, moving out west. Uh, it seems to me like when we live in Charlotte, North Carolina, like I did for 27 years, it gets really intense. I like what you're doing there. Uh, what made you decide to do that, to go out to Arizona and live a little bit? Uh, well, so we have some friends out here. Um, and, and two, I mean, with the West Coast Swing in March, uh, mm. we always would spend, you know, a week, week and a half out here in Arizona, renting an Airbnb. And same thing in November, you know, we rent a house. And over the years, I'm just like, man, I just really love Arizona. The weather is always amazing for the time of the year that we're out here. Um, you know, there's a bunch of activities, just, you know, great food, lots of things to do. We're closer to our families, you know, so um, it just makes it a little easier for us. You know, we're, we're closer to our family, but not too close. Um, yeah. So it, it's good. And, and last year, um, you know, Caitlin was pregnant with our son, uh, Cooper, uh, who actually just turned a year old a couple days ago. But she wanted to have, you know, the, the baby out here and, and gets to, you know, get to spend some time out here. So, yeah, we decided to, to buy a house and um, it's been fun. It's I've really, really enjoyed it. It's uh, like I said earlier, it's just it's just nice to kind of get away from the racing scene a little bit. You kind of reset your mind, get uh, recharged, all of that. So um, it is nice. I'm out here because I'm like I'm itching to go racing again, you know, just because I haven't been around the racing that much. So um, I think it's good to, to be out here. And um, yeah, I, I really enjoy it. You know, like I said, we have some friends, um, JP, who kind of manages my life. He moved out here as well. Um, so we have some really close friends and a lot of stuff to do. So it's a, it's a good time. I, I guess uh, now is the best time for me to ask you this question because you, you said you're itching to race. So uh, Vado is getting ready to start up. Uh, it seems to me like that's going to just be right down the hill from where you're at, so to speak. You're you're almost already there. Dirt racing is is starting up what uh, in a week or two? Uh, this weekend, um, I'll I'll head there on Friday. Um, yeah, it's only I'm I was on the fence about driving or flying and uh, <laughs> five hour drive from here, but I decided to just uh, get a commercial flight to El Paso and, and do that. So. Um, we'll head there Friday and, and yeah, I mean, I'm excited, really excited to get, uh, get there. It's a great track. Um, Royal Jones and his whole crew do a great job. I haven't raced a dirt late model since like June, I think at tri city. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's been, been a while and I really enjoy the late model too. So just, uh, excited to get in there, get raced with Kevin and Jacqueline and Dave and everybody who's, who's, um, you know, part of the six car and, um yeah hopefully we can go there and do a good job and, and maybe get it win uh a win or two would be nice well let's come back to dirt racing in a little bit uh, let's start like this uh there were so many ways we could start our conversation but i really do want to go to tony stewart uh you're young you're only 31 years old and uh 
I agree with what Tony Stewart said about you. He said, Kyle Larson is the best driver that he's ever seen in his generation. Uh, he said that you are, are better than him. When Tony Stewart said that about you, um, what went through your mind? Huh. I, <laughs> it's, it's honestly, it's an honor, first off, you know, to like have a guy who I believe, you know, has been the most talented race car driver that I've ever seen, you know, growing up, you know, being able to jump in from different disciplines and, and compete at a high, li- high level when championships and races and all that, you know, say that that I'm the best racer he's ever seen it's it's just uh it's an honor and in I don't know it's, at times you don't really believe it or, or want to believe it because you you, you still none you you understand that you're young and you know maybe I'm only halfway through my career and there's still a lot left that I want to accomplish and feel like I can accomplish so yeah when you hear compliments like that it's really cool but at the same time it's like hard to appreciate it a ton because I'm right in the thick of it so um, but it, it is, it's awesome. And, um, you know, it's a uh, really cool that I got to compete with Tony and race with him, you know, in midgets and sprint cars and NASCAR and, and all of that. So, and two, you know, I've really tried to model my career and career path and what I race and what I do after him and, um, and, and not only on the driving side, but even, you know, the, the team ownership stuff that I did for a little bit, um, you know, the promotion stuff that we're doing now. Um, really, you know, he kind of laid the groundwork for all that for, for a guy like me, um, to want to try and emulate and copy. So, um, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe now I might have to go NHRA race in some, some time when I'm in my <laughs> late forties or fifties, but no, he's, uh, Tony's, Tony's definitely the one guy that I've looked up to the most out of, out of any other race car drivers. So, um, yeah, it, it means a lot when, when he speaks highly of me. I had a great conversation with your brother-in-law, Brad Sweet, five-time World of Outlaw Sprint Car Champion. Uh, You and him are starting high limit. You have. We'll get to that conversation a little bit. But when I was talking to Brad, uh, you came up a little bit. How can you not? And he gave you a great compliment. Uh, We were talking about your talent. And, And Brad said that one of your best qualities is sometimes you don't, that you don't recognize how great you are. He, he says that sometimes it's oblivious to you, Kyle. And, and right there you say you, it's because you're, you're right in the middle of your career. And I, and I must say this, I don't want to be long-winded about this question, but I asked Tony Stewart one time, I said, do you recognize you have a God-given talent? And he says, every day I thank the man above. So is, is Brad right? You're just you're oblivious to your talent? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know if oblivious is the right word, but yeah, you know, I, I mean, I obviously, like Tony said, you know, I'm, I understand that I do have a God given talent and good, yeah, <laughs> but again, like when you're in the middle of it, yeah, like I said, I'm only maybe who knows halfway through my career. I'm only 31. You know, I, I, I would love to race through my fifties. Um, So, yeah, I don't know. When you're racing 100 times a year and, and, you know, trying to battle for wins and run up front and all that, and when you have good years, it's it's hard to, like, I don't know, reflect on it and and really appreciate it because you're already looking ahead to the next year um, and the next race you want to win. So um, I feel like that's where I'm at right now in my career. But obviously, too, you know, I, I know I've accomplished a lot and, and like, I, I think back to like 2020 and 21, you know, like now, I mean, just a few years from then, like it'll, you know, I'll, I'll think about a, a race or a moment or, or really, you know, like winning the cup series championship is probably the one race. And I'm like, I can't believe, you know, I did that. Yeah. Um, so no, it's just, uh, I'm blessed to like, I, I obviously get to race with some of the best car owners and crew chiefs in the business. So that helps a lot. Um, but more than just talent, it, it does take a lot of work. And, and I feel like that's something that I've gotten better at the last, you know, four or five years is actually like understanding that I have talent, but trying to work to be better uh, mentally, you know, physically, all of that, you know, it's important. We have race car drivers that just run NASCAR, you know, my brother, Rusty, uh, Ricky Rudd, 
Dale Earnhardt Jr. There are, you know, 95% of the NASCAR drivers that run NASCAR and that's it. However, the last time I remember seeing somebody like you is probably my other brother, Kenny Schrader. You and Schrader uh, share the same desire to race everything you can. Uh, Schrader's slowing up a little bit now. He's he's kind of running his mod. And that's it. But is is that your goal? Is your goal to run everything there is, or does it just happen? Uh, well, I think, I think part of it just happens, but again, I go back to like Tony Stewart, you know, I, when I was young, like he was racing midgets, sprint cars, dirt late models, dirt modifieds all while still racing a cup car or an Indy car or, or whatever. And he was the guy that I look, looked up to the most. And, um, you know, and, and I, I think probably I realized that I really enjoy driving a lot of different cars and, and you know, I've had success in it. And um, you hear about AJ Foy, Mario Andretti, Tony Stewart, Parnelli Jones, guys like that who are, you know, the best of their generations. And so I think that probably made it turn into the goal of mine of being in the same category of driver as that. And um, so, yeah, that's why I think I've always pursued racing lots of different types of cars. I feel like it makes me a better driver you know, when you can learn different disciplines um, and it makes you feel good too when, when you do do good. And, and I think the challenge of it also um, is probably the most important piece, but um, yeah, it's just, uh, I, I enjoy it probably is the, the, the biggest thing. I want to brag on you one more time and then we'll, we'll get into some, some fun. Uh, I like to remind people, you know, on Kenny conversation. So, you're a NASCAR champion. All right, let's start like this. Kyle Larson, 31 years old, already a NASCAR champion. Won the King's Royal, one of the biggest wing sprint car races in the world, or maybe, you know, close to the Knoxville Nationals. And you won the Knoxville Nationals. You've won the Chili Bowl. This is the one that's pretty incredible. You won the 24 hours of Daytona with Chip Ganassi. Uh, listen, I can go on and on. And and, the, and it's show and tell time. So when, it, when it's like, how am I going to brag on Kyle? Because I didn't have enough paper. So I thought I'd make fun of how great you are. Check this out. We can, it, 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 this is your success. You see what I'm saying? So when you see all that, these are, these are unbelievable events. Now, out of all the conversations I've ever done, I got to you and I went, my Lord, you've done it all. Although you're still so young. What are the things that are on your radar first and foremost that you still want to win that somehow is not on that two foot long list that you've already done? Uh, there, Honestly, there's a lot. I mean, because there's a lot that I haven't really got to compete in, you know, and, and, uh, Indy 500 is obviously a, an easy one to talk about. Um, We're going to talk about that. You know, I would love to win that, but I'm, I'm really just happy to be able to race it. But then even, you know, I, I've, uh, I've been lucky enough to accomplish a lot on the dirt side of things, but again, I mean, there's not much I've competed in. I, I think I ran the national open once at Williams Grove. I would love to win that Tusk score 50. You know, I've only got to run that a couple times. Um, you know, Houston's Jackson Nationals in the late model side, there's a lot, you know, that I would love to be able to accomplish, you know, someday. Um, I'm, I'm happy that I've won, you know, one crown jewel with the Prairie Dirt Classic, but, you know, if I could someday win the dream, the world, the show me 100, the, you know, <laughs> I, the list goes on and on. There's so many big races. Um, I'm laughing because most drivers are like, I want to win the NASCAR this and you're over here. And I'm a dirt racer, so, you know, we're kind of like, you know, a Prairie Dirt Classic, that's Fairberry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there's there's definitely stuff in, in NASCAR as well. There's just less races. You know? Yeah. There's less, you know, marquee events. Um, you know, the Brickyard 400 would be cool. Uh, Daytona 500. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, those might be the only two, like, marquee events that – are left on the NASCAR side that I would love to win. Um, I mean, I want to win at every racetrack. That'd be great. 
I won, I won in Martinsville, um, which is unbelievable to me. So that one feels like a, like a crown jewel, but, um, I don't know. There's just, that there's a lot and there's probably a lot that's not even on my radar as of right now. Um, because you know, who knows where my life and career might go, you know, 15 years from now, um, when hopefully I'm still somewhere close to my prime, um, and, and what other, you know, racing might pop up, but, um, 24 hour Le Mans would be fun to run someday. Mm. You know, wow. Stuff like that. You know, I, I think fortunately for me, I think I could have the opportunity to compete in a lot of big events. Um, but yeah, we just have to you know, kind of wait and see. It's tough right now. You know, when I'm running every weekend for points in the cup series, it's, it's hard to go hit all those big races. So let's, let's have fun now. Uh, I just wanted to establish you and everything that you've already done. I think everybody would have loved to have been a fly on the wall when you told your car owner, Mr. H, Rick Hendrick, uh, how did you put the deal together? Tell me the moment. Give me some details. How did you say, Rick, you need to let me race whatever I want to race? <laughs> well, <laughs> so, I mean, it was, you know, I, I lost my job and all that in 2020 and, I had, you know, went back to dirt racing and had had a phenomenal season. And I don't know, I think it was like June or July. Um, Jeff Gordon called me. He's like, Hey, uh, Mr. H says he wants to meet with you and I, I have no idea what it's about, but, uh, you just need to get to Charlotte so we can go meet with him. And I was, I was at Port Royal racing the sprint car, you know, two day weekend that, that weekend. And Drove my bus because I was living in my motorhome, basically, you know, on the road racing uh, for like seven weeks at a time. So I think that ended a seven week stretch on the road. So we drove back to our place in North Carolina all night. Then I drove down to you know meet up with Jeff and Rick. And um, yeah, basically the conversation was going great. And, and he was saying how he missed seeing me race in NASCAR and loves my style and, and would really love to have me on his team. And obviously I was excited about that. And at the end of it, he's like, well, is there anything that you want? <laughs> and, uh, you know, me, I was really nervous just because, you know, I had no real leg to stand on with everything that went on with me. And um, I was just like, I would really love to keep racing this dirt stuff, expecting him because, you know, with, with Hendrick Motorsports history, you know, they didn't really want their drivers running stuff outside of NASCAR. So I was expecting him to kind of laugh at me and, and, uh, or, or just, you know, or kind of get upset and say my focus wasn't where it needed to be and stuff like that. But, um, you know, thankfully, yeah, I mean, he was all good with it. You know, Jeff had, you know, stepped in kind of right away and said that, you know, they were changing their brand a little bit and, and what they do with their drivers and, and they would be okay with it. So, yeah, never in a million years would I think that, one, I would be racing at Hendrick Motorsports and two – while racing at Hendrick Motorsports, be able to run whatever I wanted to, whenever I wanted to. They have literally, been, they have literally <laughs> never said no. You have to get permission for all these races that I run, and they have never said no. And two, it's funny, you know, Cliff Daniels, my crew chief, he's like, a lot of times he's the one who's like, you need to go race this race, or you need to go do this, do that. Um, Twenty twenty one, I think it was. We were, you know, I wasn't going to run the National Open because it was during nascar weekend and uh he i can't remember how it went but he was like you are you running national open i was like no you know it's in the playoffs and this and that he's like no you need to you need to go there you need to race you need to try and win that race so uh, i think we finished second so um yeah that's this is really cool to have the support of of cliff and jeff and rick and jeff andrews jack and Alice, like all of them you know let me go kind of do what i want to do which is which is awesome yeah. So psychologically, has the team, has Jeff or Rick or your crew chief, have they, do they, they feel like by giving you that freedom that keeps you, keeps some of this energy level, uh, you know, you could be holed up in the motorhome on a Friday, Saturday night, but you go run the dirt car or you go run something like that. Does everybody think you're better? Because you you go run the dirt car and you're not sitting in the motorhome on Friday and Saturday night. Um, I mean, I, I haven't really had that conversation with them, but I would assume that. Well, first, I'll say I'm sure they would be 
happy or happier if I wasn't racing every weekend or every weekday. But I think they're allowing me to still do it. So I think they believe in it like I do. I, I think it there's a balance that goes along with it. Like I think, you know, there's a side that keeps me competitive, keeps me race in racing situations, keeps me learning, all of that. But then I mean, I can't lie. Like there's times of the year where I'm I'm burnt out and I'm I'm wore out and I just want to go home and sleep, but you know, I'm got to go race this race. Cause once I commit to a race, like I don't, I don't like to, you know, say that I, Oh, I'm tired. I, I can't go do it. You know, cause the guys that I'm racing for Paul Silva, Kevin Rumley, like they're doing this for a living. So when I'm not racing, I'm not making them money. Um, so once I commit, I, w- I want to commit, but it's definitely a balance. I mean, middle of the summer when I'm never home, like, I get wore out. Um, you know, there's been a couple of times like last year, you know, I could tell Cliff was frustrated with, you know, me getting, getting in late and having me up early and, um, you know, a little bit tired. And, and, um, I, I feel like I'm always focused on racing. Um, but you know, when, when you have, you know, an average race or something, it's easy to, you know, point that, you know, maybe you weren't a hundred percent prepared for the, the race or whatever. But in my eyes, you know, when I'm racing all the time, like that's all I care about. And, and I'm, and I'm focused on it all. I want to win every race I run, um, all of that. So no, I, it's, it's, uh, like I said, it's a balance, but, uh, I, I think more than anything, it helps me overall, which is good. I feel like Rick is not just a champion, but, uh, I mean, he's, he seems to be a great human being and he hedged his bet and he, and he became a champion he said, do whatever you want to do. And you've already done everything for him. So I think he came out the winner and it looks to me, you know, from my standpoint, every body received what they want out of the deal. Congratulations. Uh, I was your biggest fan during that time. Uh, and I just think it's awesome. So one little, one little bitty thing uh, that I have wrote down here, how in the world, what plane, what planes, plural, <laughs> I mean, you'll you'll be at the Knoxville Nationals, and you got to be in Loud, New Hampshire, the next morning. What kind of travel are you organizing to do doing all this? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, so I, I do most of my logistics um, on my own. Um, so I mean, I, I try to fly commercial as much as possible. Um, I would say half the time, at least, I'm probably flying commercial to races. Uh, Martin Shrix Jr. He has a charter service um, through his aviation company, so I, I use that a fair amount. Um, they're pretty cost effective. Um, and then this past year, you know, for our our, our high limit races, um, yeah. the midweek shows, a lot of times we would take uh, the Hendrick team plane. Um, you know, I would pay for that, and that way we could take because a lot of our employees um, this past season you know, are located in you know North Carolina, so it worked out, you know, that we could all, you know, fly together into the racetrack and, and do our jobs and get home the same night, which is great. Um, currently I am in the, the market of buying my own plane, uh, just for the logistics of, of how much simpler it would be. And I've gone 10 years of cup racing without owning a plane. So I feel like I've done a good frugal. Yeah. I feel like, you know, I, I've done a, a fair, fair job of not, you know, wasting money and private flights are, or private, you know, stuff is, is really expensive, but, um, you know, the time is money and the convenience factor and all that. I think I'm getting to the point, my wife's getting to the point, you know, where we have three kids, like it's a lot, you know, to, uh, race as often as I do travel as much as we do. And, and, um, you know, I think we're to the point where, you know, convenience and all that, that means, means a lot. So, uh, we're definitely in the market right now and I'm excited about that. You know, it's, like I said, we've gone 10 years of, of, you know, doing it, you know, a good way. Um, I'm ready to uh, make life easier on all of us. My children would get roughed up years ago about me being a NASCAR driver. And I told my kids, I said, never apologize for your dad working his butt off. And, you know, we had a King Air 200. We had a motor home. Uh, it, it just, Kyle, you know, I was doing so many appearances for Square D. I justified buying an airplane because I was gone every week, you know, yeah. taking care of sponsors. But I agree with your wife. Uh, you know, it's not just you. It's definitely a family affair. And uh, she's a superstar. Your kids are, too. We all love watching you. It, it's so much fun kind of watching your show. So 
let's um speaking of a show i think that's a show in itself right there <laughs> uh, just uh, you, the larson's loading up oh, going to new vado <laughs> yeah. yeah if you could if you could pull us around for trip whether it be to vacation or a racetrack yeah. whatever it's uh It'd be it'd be a good reality show, comedy show, whatever. It's uh, it's stressful. It's stressful for sure. But uh, I enjoy having the family around. And too, I mean, I also I enjoy getting to go race. You know, by myself some as well. You know, they don't go to every race, but it's it's a nice getaway sometimes. You know, from the crazy life at home to go to go race, which racing is always you know really relaxing to me. So, um, but I do and I enjoy them coming and and experience it all and. Um, it's just tough. You know, as our kids are getting older, they're kind of into their own activities. So they don't get to go as much anymore. Let's switch gears. Um, we'd be shorting your fans if we didn't. And we're going to get back to dirt racing. We're, we're going to talk about high limit in a minute and Chili Bowl and Australia. But we got to cover some of the, the big stuff first. Uh, you are going to race the Indy 500 this year. Hendrick Motorsports, McLaren, uh, can you just shed a little bit of light on, uh, I mean, we watched it play out. We watched you fit your seat. We watched you test. Where are you at right now in the whole Indianapolis 500 situation? Uh, right now, there, there really hasn't been much going on. Um, you know, I had heard rumblings about maybe getting to do a test at Phoenix, but uh, I think that's kind of came and went. Um but I believe there's an open test in the beginning of April or something that I'm definitely doing at the Speedway. So uh, that'll be my first time on track, you know, with other cars on the track. Um, so it'd be nice to kind of get in the, a situation where, you know, people are passing me or I get to pass somebody, you know, stuff like that to try and just get me a little bit more up to speed before we get to the month of May. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I've just been training this off season you know there's a gym here in scottsdale where we're at that i i go to so uh the indy car stuff was de definitely a little more it definitely takes a little bit more strength um than than the stock car um so yeah just trying to be ready on that side of things and um you know i've been watching onboard stuff just trying to just learn any any little thing really so um but yeah i'm excited about it it's uh i don't know i i try not to think about it too much because I feel like it's going to make the time feel like it takes forever to get to the month of May. But um, for sure, I mean, I'm excited to get there, excited to get racing. I mean, honestly, nervous as well. I think it'd be hard not to uh, be nervous about, you know, going 220 or 245 and qualifying and all that. So, um, but, you know, I know I'm with a great team. Um, I'm proud that Rick Hendrick's involved in it as well. I think, you know, if you would ask him four years ago, if you would ever be a part of the Indy 500, he'd probably say, heck no. So, <laughs> Hey, it's a chance for Rick to go to Victor Lane uh, because you very much can win this. So when you were doing your testing and you just mentioned uh, being more physical, I would assume that's in the G-force. But what are some of the things that caught you off guard, surprised you uh, driving the Indy car? Yeah, I mean, there – it really wasn't too surprised. Like nothing was too surprising to me. Um, the physical part of it stuff was, you know, the G's a not really like a little bit, like I did notice, you know, a couple of, you know, a few times, like in the corners, like if you exhaled before you turned in the corner, it was like hard to kind of like inhale while mm -hmm. you're in the corner, but it wasn't, it wasn't a, you know, wild or, or a bunch, but it's definitely more than a stock car. Like I've never noticed that before really in any, anything that I've driven, um, so just the weight <laughs> on your body and lungs, um, you know, the cockpits are so small, like everything I've ever ran has rib supports. There's not much rib support in there. So like when you get in the corner, like your core wants to, you know, shift over some down the straightaways and even down pit lane, honestly, like the cars want to pull left on their own, like really hard. So you're like always kind of turning right a little bit in like, for whatever reason, my thumb, <laughs> my thumbs would get, you know, kind of cramped up and tight. But uh, with each run, it got, you know, I think I was just maybe tensed up, but with each run, it got, you know, a little bit easier. So, um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I'm sure by the time you get your two and a half weeks of track time, your body and, and muscles and muscle memory and all that will be pretty dialed in. But, uh, yeah, it, it's definitely, it's definitely different. You know, they don't have power steering. 
all that. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, it's its own way different than anything I've, I've driven before, but it's, uh, it's pretty cool. I'm going to call an audible right now. Uh, I feel like it is mouthy as I've been my whole life and I, I grew up hyperactive and, but I do have the ability to listen really well. And we're going to call an audible right now. Just listen to you explain some things. How in the hell did you start, start racing? I, I mean, you don't really have anybody. I mean, did family, I never heard of anybody. Did you start racing by yourself? Uh, so I'm, I'm first generation racer. Um, but my, my parents are massive race fans, probably the biggest race fans I think anybody could know. And, uh, they, my, my dad's been that way his whole life, but you know, him and my mom started dating, uh, in their teenage years and, and went to West Capitol raceway. And, um, you know, he got her into it. She became, you know, addicted to racing. And, uh, my dad actually grew up just a few doors down from, uh, Tim Green. So, you know, he kind of, like I said, has been around it his whole life. And, um, my dad likes to build things and, you know, build slot cars, goat carts, all that. So, you know, him and his buddies would always go race go karts, just fun carts. And, um, you know, he built me a go kart when I was like four and got to play around in that a little bit. And, uh, then we bought my first go kart from uh, Kyle Hurst, who just lived, you know, a few blocks away from us, uh, or neighborhoods away from us. And um, yeah, we started going racing ever since then. So um, yeah, I was seven, I guess, at that time, and ran go karts, outlaw karts for full time every week, you know, two nights a week basically um, until I was fourteen. Then got into sprint cars. So unbelievable. Uh, you know, we hear of. Uh... Al Unser Jr., Al Unser Sr., you know, Bobby Unser, Michael Andretti, Mary Andretti, and here you are. That is very rare. Uh, I, You know, I guess in some way you're a little bit like Tony uh, or even Kenny. Well, Kenny Schrader's dad was was Bill uh, and raced locally, but uh, that is actually very amazing to me. Now, when you started racing, help me out in kind of order here. Did you and Rico Abreu come up a little bit together? I mean, I see the videos are everywhere. Of you and him running the little vineyard racetrack there. Did was he one of your friends that you started racing with? So, no. I mean, he was. He started his career late. Like he was maybe fifteen or sixteen. <laughs> okay, maybe even that's older. funny. <laughs> I was out so. Yeah, so I raced go karts from a la carts from seven to I was fourteen. I got into sprint cars. I was racing for Dave and Debbie Bertulo. Wow. And um, yeah, we somehow I don't I can't remember how it all happened or worked, but Rico had this nice, you know I hadn't met him yet, but they were, you know, were putting on this little exhibition race at their vineyard um track that they have there in St. Helena. Um so a bunch of us were going there. I don't know, there's probably 20 of us maybe and um yeah that was the first night i believe i met rico and uh and then, yeah quickly after that we became really good friends um you know rich staddlehofer who you know does a lot of work with the abrus he started sponsoring our sprint car um so i think that was probably that was probably the third year i was racing so i was probably yeah like close to 17 mm -hmm. um and then yeah dave abru and rich staddlehofer they're really good really big for my career, you know, Stadeloffer started sponsoring the 83V that I was running. Then, you know, he helped us transition to racing for the Cading family of the following year, which I think then Rico, the second year I was probably at Cading. So Rico probably started running for the Cadings in 2011, maybe 10. I was, I was there with the Cadings in 2010. Um, I think Rico wasn't there until 11. Um, so then, yeah, then we were kind of like, you know, best friends, you know, like teammates in a way, you know, yeah. his, uh, 2012, I started getting to like actually race for David, um, you know, in their Indiana stuff with Dave, Davy Jones. Um, so I ran their non-wing car, which is a, you know, a fun story, I guess we can get into that later if you want. Um, and then that, cool. that transitioned into him owning a bunch of wing sprint car stuff for us. And, uh, I ran, yeah, for them for, I don't know, 2012 and 13. I think the first time I really watched you air it out uh, 
you and I were in the middle of Arizona somewhere. You were in an open in, wheel mid Peoria, yeah. Arizona, Grand Canyon. Canyon, yeah. Well, you were. I, I thought I, I saw you at the pit gate. Uh, you were just getting known. I looked at you and gave you a big compliment. And uh, man, you aired that thing out. And you, you and those open wheel midgets, your ability to not make them bike is more amazing to me. People will flip a lot. And then drivers like you, do, do, do you have, what do you do when a track's rough and everybody's flipping? What, what do you do? What kind of driving talent do you use to defend to not make it bike? <laughs> you got to run the shit out of it <laughs> when it's running across. The, is that what you do? Really? I mean, you can't slide into it, but you got to have your speed, your wheel spin, I think, I feel like, I mean, depending on how it is, you got to run, you got to run into it quick and, and be loaded. I feel like with the brake pedal some, um, but you can't be erratic with your feet. Cause then you get the car kind of going crazy. But um, yeah, I, I love when it's, when it's heavy and rough. Cause usually the guys that air it out, like you said, and, and run harder than others, you know, their cars operate a little bit better and, and uh, they're faster. So um, I, I'm always smiling when I see it, you know, when there's a train delay or something and we know we can start the racing. Cause I, I feel like that's, you know, where I can have a big advantage over, over, you know, majority of the field. That's interesting. What you said, I want to dive into that just a little bit more because I got a friend in town. His name's Mike Harrison. And when a track he's, is he's just, right. we just junk, he, he leaves us all. I yeah. mean, he's he's the best there is, and I and I, I feel like, you know, that's that's when you guys. I mean, when I first started dirt racing, I was like forty four years old, and I'm like, I'd see the track just destroyed, and I'm like, oh my god, but you and Mike thrive on that stuff, and do you feel like it's? I mean, is is it down here? Is it playing the piano loading? Like you're saying, do you load the brake and gas and I mean, it's nothing like, like I would think that what I do right now is, you know, I go in on the right front because I don't want the right rear to see first. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it all just depends. Like I'm, I'm just, I'm picturing kind of one lane around the bottom smoother. And then there's like some rough choppiness through the middle and you can go way above it, find you know, some, a lot of grip and smoother surface or whatever, but run through the holes. Yeah. I mean, I think, you definitely can't hit it too sideways, but you got to get your wheel spin up as much as you can. Um, That's you gotta, key. Which takes a lot of confidence, I think, you know, like entering hard. Um, but you got to enter straight, I feel like, um, all of that. So I, I don't know. There's definitely a handful of guys that got it figured out. I, I really don't know, like, what my driving style is. It's just God-given talent. You, you, you adjust in the millisecond, don't you? I guess I don't like I I'm <laughs> really really bad at like you know drivers will come over and like what are you doing you know how are you using brake are you lifting and this and that or like me trying to coach Owen like I'm terrible at it because I don't pay attention to what I'm doing I'm just doing it I guess but um <laughs> yeah I don't know I'm a terrible coach uh, it's all good I, I understand uh, you're you're just going and doing and these are these are God-given talents that we do so Dirt racers, um, I find them really interesting. Um, you know, I, I grew up around dirt. We raced Tri-City Speedway, Granite City, Illinois. My dad, Russ, my brother, Mike. Rusty went to USAC right away. We raced, you know, AJ Foyt in stock cars. We don't see them anymore. I don't want to be long-winded here, but I got to tell you why I'm asking this question. It seemed like when I came up, Everybody loved NASCAR. NASCAR, I mean, I love NASCAR, and I wanted to go NASCAR. And I started in asphalt because I knew that's how I could make a living. Nowadays, I see some drivers like a Bobby Pierce, uh, my dear friend Nick Hoffman. Uh, now we got Ricky Thornton. So I want to say this, and I, I need your response. So I had to set you up so badly, and I, and I hope – and Ricky tells me he listens. I want to say, Ricky Thornton, you've got so much talent. 
that it's time for you to go NASCAR. Because I feel like if you just ran it five years, you'd make so much money that you wouldn't have to worry about it again. So the, there seems to be like some drivers don't like NASCAR. What, what would you say to like a Ricky Thornton right now? I don't want to see him go all the way to 40 years old. I'd like to see Ricky try to make it NASCAR and get that big hit. What do you, what do you think about everything I just said? Uh, well, I mean, I don't think Ricky would make as much money in five years as he is racing, you know, dirt stuff. So that's good stuff right there. Yeah. No, honestly, I feel like he's got to think it's going to take him five years or so to make it to the cup series. So, um, and even when you get to the cup series, like these days, I guarantee Ricky Thornton's making more than half the drivers are. So, um, probably that's a quote right there. (laughs) So oh, no, I, I, I would, I mean, he's probably my age, right? 31, 32, like, what's the point? Like, just keep doing what you're doing and, um, and all that. I mean, I think, you know, for, for really young guys who have, who have a runway of, of racing, like then, yeah, I mean, if you can, you know, you can go try and try and, you know, grind it out and make it for you know four or five years. And if it doesn't work out, you can still go back and, have a great career in dirt, but you know, right now Ricky's in his prime and, and that's almost probably too late to, to try and make it to the cup Good series. Point. So yeah, I don't know. Um, and, and two, I, I don't know if that's really where his interests are at um, or, or if that's where they were at of trying to make the NASCAR. I think anybody would take the opportunity if given to them, but um, I don't know. It's just, it's tough. There's not many seats. It's not guaranteed to make it. Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, how good you are. Things got to line up the right way. You can't just go plug somebody in a mid-pack Xfinity car and go, you know, win races. Um, it's really hard to. It's really hard for me to tell who's talented in, in payment stuff. So, um, but no, I think Ricky's doing just fine how he is. Uh, I mean, the guy just made, or his car made like a million dollars or more than that this year. So. Um, that's just racing. You know, that's not even talking about merchandise and all that. So he's doing just fine. You know, when I started racing in NASCAR, you know, everybody, you know, we were making millions of dollars a year. Uh, and, and Kenny conversation is just about information, right? I mean, me, I'm making, I was making millions of dollars a year and I'm good to go. And I look at some of my dirt racing friends and I worry about them. But I guess it's not my job, you know. I'm always talking to Gordy Gundaker and, and Nick Hoffman. Uh, the reason I said that, the reason I just told you that I was making millions back then, I was bringing my own sponsors, Square D, all that. But I guess it's true. Uh, do NASCAR Cup drivers just make a lot less money now? I, I've been hearing that. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know everybody's deal, but um... – I mean, you, you still have your your top tier drivers that probably still are not making anywhere near what Jimmy Johnson or Jeff Gordon or anything like that. But um, you're still I mean, I make a really good living. Like I'm totally happy with with my contract and, and all that. But it's still not to nearly the level, um, probably not close to even half of maybe what Jimmy was getting paid in, in his heyday. But I'm still I know I'm making way more than than a good majority of the field um you know so i just i just i don't know it's just i think i don't really know what to think but um i think a lot of guys are just happy to say they're a cup series driver and they don't care they just want to be there and racing on sundays and that just hurts the whole overall you know i guess driver side of it and trying to have leverage uh for for some of these drivers to make more money so um i mean yeah there's there's I bet you the top four drivers in the War of Outlaws Sprint Car Series are making more money than, um, you know, a, a third to half of the Cup Series guys, probably half the Cup Series guys. So, yeah, that's pretty crazy to think about. Um, but, yeah, everybody chooses their own their own route, I guess. Yeah, it, it's changed a lot. Do, do you think do you think yourself and Christopher Bell? are sort of the last of the Mohicans 
you know, there's an old story out there, the very last of the Indians, you'll never see him again. I mean, do you ever think we'll see, you know, I mean, you and Christopher had this God given talent and you made it, you made it in NASCAR from listening to you right now. It, it, it sounds to me like that's, it's getting harder. Um, I wouldn't say it's getting harder. No, I mean, at least I don't, I don't personally believe it's any harder nowadays to make it to the cup series than it was when I came in in 2012. I think the best, maybe not all the best drivers make it to the cup series, but you know, if you've got talent, you can make it to the cup series. So, and, and without bringing a dime, I believe. So, you know, if you, if you're young, you, I, I believe you need to be young. I mean, Josh Berry, he's, he's, he's made it, you know, and he's older than I am. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're young and you're kicking ass and winning races, like you don't need to bring money. And, and that's, I, I do get, I do get annoyed and a little frustrated when I hear people say, Oh, you have to bring millions of dollars and this and that. No, you don't, you know, you, you can still, if you, if you show that you're really good and you represent a team and sponsors and companies and all that good, you don't need to bring anything. You don't need to have a rich dad. I hate hearing about rich dads and all this. If you've got talent, you can make it. So, um, yeah, Rick Hendrick, he wants the best drivers in his car. Roger Penske wants the best drivers in his car. Joe Gibbs wants the best drivers in their car. So they're going, if you've got talent, you, you can make it. So it doesn't, it doesn't take money, in my opinion. So that sets me up for this. And I'm sure you knew this was coming. Uh, you were doing something, you and your brother-in-law, Brad Sweet, uh, I guess as I read it, Flow, the app. Uh, so you tell tell me when I'm wrong. You, Brad Sweet, your brother-in-law, and Flo, you have started high limit racing. Uh, I think it's awesome because you have uh, the Lucas Oil late models right now. You've got the World of Outlaw late models right now. Two series in World of Outlaw late models and Lucas Oil. They they thrive together. Uh, it appears from reading everything is that you all are starting high limit racing. So sprint car racers can make a living. Your pay is going to be really good. Is that, is that what that's about? I think that's the main goal for sure. For me, I mean, that's where the whole idea of, of trying to start a series, um, you know, even back, back before we started the national series was, you know, I, and really, I mean, I think once I went late model racing is when I realized that, man, like, cause I didn't pay any attention to late models. I uh, read that. <laughs> I was just like, man, these guys are making really good money. I mean, there is 20, 50,000, hundred thousand win races every other week. It seems like, and, and nowadays, like every week, um, where sprint cars, like they, nobody paid attention to late models. They were happy. I mean, a $15,000 win race was like, Oh, this is awesome. Um, and that's what late model guys are racing for on the daily. So, um, and two, you know, I, I really was, you know, when like, there's no exclusivity, I guess, to late mall racing. Like if you're an outlaw guy, you can go around Lucas races. If you're a Lucas guy, you can go around outlaw races and sprint cars is, is controlled. You know, the outlaws, you know, they've done a really good job of, of building their brand and especially on the sprint car side and, and, you know, controlling their drivers and, um, and, and two, I mean, they race a lot, so there's not even a whole lot of opportunity for them to go race other stuff. But, yeah, I don't, I don't think outlaw drivers and teams were aware that there was a freedom side of it on, on the late model side. So, um, you know, that was important to me. But but really just, you know, when I see guys like Davenport and Overton and all them clearing a million dollars on a season and, and the best sprint car guy was like 600, I'm like, man. These are like this to me, they're equal, like equal series and racing. Like why can't, you know, sprint car guys make that much money. So yeah, our, our, you know, we're trying to start the series to build the sport, have a little competition, you know, raise purses, raise all of that, make things, you know, easier on the teams on our side of things. You know, like I mentioned, freedom's a big factor. Um, trying to, you know, come up with a different, business plan too with our charter system and all that to make car owners potentially make 
or have value with their race team down the road. So, um, yeah, just trying to just trying to adjust the game a little bit and, and try and just make everybody make a little bit more money. And, and because this sport is super expensive, and and right now, I mean, you know, when you're owning a team, you're you just own assets. You don't own any own anything other than that. So having hopefully having some value to the team will mean something. I created controversy when, uh, you know, we got this YouTube show and this is Kenny conversation. This is the mature side of me. <laughs> then we got the Kenny Wallace show where I say what I think. Now I don't, I don't try to, you know, hit the beehive. I don't, I don't try to create controversy, but when I was saying I, I did a Kenny Wallace show and I said, dirt racers cannot make a living. Maybe, maybe the top three. Uh, after talking to your brother-in-law, uh, he told me that I, I created controversy. He said fans were coming up to him. Kenny Wallace says you can't make a living. Well, if you go back and watch my conversation, he says I was right. He said it's like the top three are running away, you know, with the Napa Auto Parts sponsorship. Then you got four, five, six. So I like what you're doing because, number one, uh, I believe dirt racers are very talented. The, the great Dale Earnhardt Sr., and you've probably heard me say this before, Sr. was a good friend of mine, and I don't know why we got along, but he said to me one day, he said, Herman, there's thousands of great race car drivers all over the world. They all can't be NASCAR. They only start in 39 or 40, and there's thousands of good race car drivers in every county, every region. So, I like what you're doing uh, just for the fact that there's nothing wrong with two divisions. Yeah. Uh, I'm really happy that you didn't make me look too bad and that you did agree. Your, your high limit is, is what it is. High limit. Uh, you guys are going to get it on. What do you know? What, what are, do you have any idea what might be your marquee events this year? Like, what are the big ones? <clears throat> uh, we have, uh, let's see, a handful of 100,000 win races. Wow. Uh, got Skagit Nationals. Gold Cup will be 100 grand from, you know, it, it used to be 50. And then, uh, like, the 2011, it went down to, like, 12. Um, and it's creeped up to 20. So we're going 100 grand there. Eldora's 100 grand. Uh, we have the Tuscora 50. I think that's, like, 75 grand, maybe, something like that. Um I'm missing a couple. We have we have a handful of big events, and plus, you know, with the freedom side of it, you know, we haven't we haven't scheduled on top of the other you know big races that the outlaws have. So, you know, if you're a high limit driver, you can go I think compete in like seven or eight hundred thousand to win races. So, um, yeah, that's that's pretty awesome and and um, all that. So, yeah, like you know, you could go around Houston, Knoxville Nationals. Uh, Kings Royal, um, those might be the three, I think, on the outlaw side you can run a national open. Um, so yeah, it's there's a lot of big races, you know, in the sprint car world these days, and um it's it's great to see. It's it's really cool to see and more traveling teams than there's been in a long time. I think the outlaws have like eleven or twelve currently committed. We have sixteen, I believe, with still hopefully a couple more coming. Um so yeah, it's uh it's pretty spectacular what's what's going on in the sprint car world right now and um, I'm glad to be a part of it. I'm glad to feel like we're helping the sport long term to to move to the next level. And you know, Brad and I and Flo, we all have a lot of big ideas on on how to make it even bigger and better. Um, it's just we got to start out somewhere, and um, you know, this is where we're at. So, yeah, I'm excited. We're only like a month away from from racing, so yeah, um, pretty pretty wild. Yeah, I'm kind of a numbers guy. I, I I look at okay, the world of outlaw guys. You're you're gonna have those guys. Top guys making a living. Now you're going to have the high limit guys up there making a living. Now, totality, we're going to have more wing dirt sprint car drivers making a living uh, because of you starting high limit. So good, good on you, Kyle. Uh, you, you're paying it forward. And there's no doubt in my mind that your popularity, like Brad said, your brother-in-law, he paid a big compliment to you. You know, you bring the fans in. Uh, you're so good. They sell these places out to come see you. Uh, hey, by the way, that, that was not going to be a question. When, when they, when you know 
when you know in your heart they're to see you, do, does that weigh on you at all, or are you oblivious to it? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, I I think I try to stay oblivious to it, so I can yeah. just, you know focus on on racing. But uh, I mean, I'll, I'll like some. I just went and ran uh, a outlaw kart race, go kart race at uh, the track I grew up racing at, Red Bluff. You know, That's awesome. Four weeks ago, and I mean, the crowd wasn't that big i thought but like you know i'm standing there watching owen race because you know, owen's there racing and they're like look at this place like it hasn't been this packed so for <laughs> yes. years or something. I'm like, and they're like it's because you're here i'm like what <laughs> like i didn't even notice so yeah um but no that i mean that makes me feel good like because a lot of those fans are i guarantee had never been to an outlaw cart race but they probably got grandkids or kids or or whatever and and you know probably maybe a handful of them went home and, you know, Christmas is coming up and maybe, they, maybe they bought their own, you know, go-kart or, or whatever. So that, that sort of stuff does make me feel good. Um, you know, going to these racetracks and whatever and, and seeing the crowds big, you know, I, I don't know when you're there, like who knows, you know, how much I'm really helping the crowd. Um, but it's, uh, it's neat. So um, I, I just, I just really like to feel like I'm making an impact on the sport. Um, again, going back to like Tony Stewart, you know, it's, a, it's very similar to like what him and Casey were doing when they were in their primes, their NASCAR career. And, um, you know, moving the needle for, for what I love is, is dirt track racing is, is really great. Those outlaw cards, those are really popular. My, my son-in-law, Brody Pompey, he married my youngest daughter. He didn't really know what he wanted to do in life, but uh, he's building them right here in my shop now. Just started. He's headed to Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. tonight uh fusion carts Th- these outlaw carts I-, I feel like did they start out there on the west coast um, they they're like go karts with motorcycle motors on them wings they're fast yeah yeah so it it originated um in red bluff um uh, at the red bluff outlaws i don't know 30 40 years 40 probably close to 40 years ago um but yeah kind of it's really like, it was really big on the West coast at Red Bluff Cycling, but they, you know, they're also in Oregon or Idaho a little bit, you know, other tracks in California. And I'd say, I don't know, 15 ish years ago, it started to kind of sprinkle outside of you know, the, the Western region into Iowa. You know, they had a big, big races there outside of Knoxville, English Creek Speedway. Um, you know, and then, it got big in North Carolina for a little while, like really big in North Carolina for a little while. And then the micros have kind of taken over at Millbridge. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's cool. It, it's, uh, they're outlaw carts are about as wild of a race car as you can get in. They I mean, shake. They made my uh, eyes vibrate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you get into two, uh, like a two stroke 500 CC engine, yeah. like your legs are numb, your heads. <laughs> you can't I know you use a big steering wheel. Does that help? Uh, I don't use a big steering wheel. I, I use whatever's normal. But I do, like when I run outlaw cart stuff now, I would say the last seven or eight years, I'm I'm a really big four-stroke guy. Um, I, I really like, because you can run either a two-stroke 500 or you can run like a four-stroke, you know, 450. Uh, I don't know what the rules are, but up to like a 520-something four-stroke. Um, and four-strokes to me are just smoother. Like it just feels like like a more natural race car. Like you can throttle it. Like the two strokes are explosive and you got to use the clutch a lot and four stroke, you can just throttle. And um, so I, I really like running the four stroke, but uh, like an indoor track at Red Bluff, everybody swears that the two strokes, two stroke stuff's way better, I think. Um, but the four stroke stuff to me is a better, better engine, better training tool probably for, for young kids coming up. But uh they're wild. I always leave my backs bruised up and, and all of that. So yes, it's, it's, fun. it's fun. What do you do with your right elbow? I always find the motors in the way. What did you, what is your technique there? Uh, I don't know. I've, I've never, I've never had an issue, but uh, maybe I'm just smaller. You know, my seat's smaller. So I probably have just more room for my elbow to tuck in. I'm guessing. Cause yeah, they're like big guys. They got to race with their elbow. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> No, it's, it's, uh, it's You're like, what the hell are they doing? I don't do that. It's great. I hadn't been in an outlaw cart in like four years, probably. And yeah. like back in, I was like, man, this thing is tiny. Like people are, you know, just line up the heat race. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like about to <laughs> crash just under yellow. So it's, uh, it's crazy, especially Red Bluff. Red Bluff is, 
nuts. Nuts. The high lane and the low lane. And well, when you run around that bottom, you got to make sure you don't wash out, don't you? Or, or it's going to be a big wreck. Uh, I mean, no, I mean, it's just like anything else, but in the go-kart stuff, you got to be ready on the clutch. Like there's a, mm. a clutch, you know, on the steering wheel, just like a dirt bike, you know, having the clutch there, it'd be on your steering wheel. So, um, at a track like Red Bluff, you know, there's a lot of like crashes and stuff. So you got to be ready to like, you know, pull the clutch, keep the engine going and, and drive away from the wreck and all that. So, um, that's probably the <laughs> part of me, getting, like not being in it for four years is just being ready on the clutch. So, um, but no, it's, it's, uh. They're, they're awesome little race cars, and um, they race at some great racetracks, like Cycland, where I grew up. Cycland, I would say, was my, my favorite track, you know, racing a la carte. It's, uh, I mean, it gets ice slick. They have, they make you on a hard tire, um, so it gets ice slick, and, I mean, you're off the throttle a lot. You know, you're pulling slide jobs, running the cushion, like, you know, close to the wall. It really, really taught me you know, how to race. I mean, I came from Cycland, Tyler Reddick, Matt DiBenedetto, um, Brad Sweet, Kyle Hurst, Robert Blue. Uh, pfft, there's a lot. There's a lot more, but it's uh, they're they're great. I mean, like I said, they're they're the most violent, rough, wild vehicles you can drive. So if you can if you can learn how to tame those, you can drive anything. I, I feel like those videos on YouTube from Red Bluff. I just I sit there and watch them like this. <laughs> I'm just, and like you you made me laugh just now because you said you got to be ready on the clutch. Because you, you you know there's a good chance of wrecking, so you don't want to kill the motor, I guess, right? You yeah. Wanna... yeah. No, okay, so we were already at an hour, uh, and, and the fans tell me, Kenny, quit talking about how long you've gone. But when I see an hour, I'm like, okay, you know, I don't want you to start tweaking on me. So let's start going downhill here a little bit, in a good way, in a good way. Uh, th this question is not meant derogatory whatsoever. So please don't take it wrong. <laughs> we saw a new phenomenon starting in NASCAR. All the drivers quitting at, at like 42 years old, whether it's Jeff Gordon, Tony Stewart, Ryan Newman, Clint Boyer. I got a list here. I mean, it goes on and on. Uh, it seemed unbelievable that uh, Kevin Harvick went to 48 you know, or whatever he is. I'm not asking you to answer because I know you can't. Do you see yourself going past 42 since that seems to be the new quitting point? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to say, like when you're in it, um, I don't, I mean, like sitting here right now, like I don't see myself going to 40. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's the one I was, so what but, I want you to know. But that's not me. That's not me retiring from racing. Like that's, right. that's that. I think I'm different than than others. You know, like Kevin. I mean, he's retiring not maybe from full time racing, but you know, he's got a plan to go in the booth and all that. You know, a lot of these drivers too. I mean, I don't think they meant to be done at 42. I just think they got kind of pushed out of the sport a little bit with you know young drivers coming up who Matt Kenseth, yeah, who could be paid a lot less than what they're making, um, stuff like that. Um, but then, like, for me, you know, going back to what we talked about early in the show, like, there's a lot of stuff that I want to accomplish while I'm still in my prime. So, um, you know, I'm 31 right now. I've been in this – I'm going going into my 11th season in the Cup Series. So, like, I've already been in it for a while. Um, so, in my eyes, if, you know, if I could race another seven or eight, seven or eight years, you know, I can earn a lot of money. I can set myself up really well. And, and I can go – you know, still be in my prime, hopefully, and go compete for, you know, premier dirt series championship, uh, you know, and, and high limit hopefully is taken off by then. And that's the premier series and, and go try and win a championship there, try and win a championship in whatever the big late model series is, um, stuff like that. You know, I'm still young. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, like I said, it's hard to say. It's hard to predict you know, right now, but, um, I've done it a long time. And, and, you know, I, like I said, I think what's important to me is, is still getting to go do and try to accomplish some big things while having the time to do it down the road while I'm still you know close to my prime. Clint Boyer, uh, I'll see him at Sturgis every year. We're like-minded, we're off centered. And, uh, <laughs> he made a good point. He says, you know, when you start racing at six years old, 40-year-old feels like you're 100. 
and I can understand your point. Uh, well, Clint, Clint has ran himself hard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think him feeling a hundred has anything to do with him racing. I, yeah, that's all done outside the race car. You uh, you mentioned something right there, and I just kind of want to finish on it. Uh, I believe everybody in the sport, whether you've said it, I believe everybody in the sport feels like you are going to retire from NASCAR and then start doing what you want full time. And uh, I guess that's pretty much what you said. And I, I, I think that's awesome because you, you're given NASCAR 20 years of your life. Yeah. And, and too, I don't want people to get spun out about it. I'm, I'm not saying no. like, I'm not saying I'm retiring at 30, whatever. And, and no, that I'm not retiring at 30 ever, but um, I love racing in NASCAR. I, I would not, be racing in NASCAR if I didn't love it. I think a lot of race fans feel that I don't like racing in NASCAR. I'm just doing it to make money and then I'm going to go retire and, and all that. I, I would have done that a long time ago if I didn't, if I didn't love what I'm doing and love racing in NASCAR and competing for wins and racing for the best team in, in the sport. I love, absolutely love what I'm doing um, right now. So, and I, and, and who knows if I'm, if I'm still, loving it you know in eight years or whatever i could still go race nascar you know your life changes so i could i who knows i could be in nascar till i'm 50 um but um you know i i love what i'm doing i get to race dirt stuff all the time i get to race nascar all the time and uh, it's a blast yeah well it, it's best to leave before they push out and i don't think they'd ever push you out in a million years you you fall in that category of the great Jeff Gordon. Uh, and as we saw with my dear friends like Matt Kenseth and Bobby Labonte, they pushed those guys out and they didn't deserve that. Those are my dear friends. Uh, all right. So uh, a couple things here towards the end. Uh, I've got to ask you this one. This one here, I, I, I've always wondered, you know, Dave Despain, you, you were a little kid when Dave Despain had a really good show called Wind Tunnel. And he said something. He said, fast race car drivers find fast rides. So with your wisdom, uh, and I don't mean this to be a loaded question, but what race car driver do you see right now that draws your attention a lot than less? In other words, every time, who do you find going, that, guy, that guy's a good driver? Like a young kid coming up? Just anything. Or, you give me uh, it could be it could be six ten drivers. Just yeah, give me some names. Well, I think for me personally, I think the next like young kid who's up and coming is definitely Corey Day. I don't see anybody Corey even. Day. Yeah, I, I I don't see anybody even close to his level, um, and he's only he's still in high school. So I've never even heard of him. Tell me about him. Oh, he's. I mean, he's he's basically me. Like he's. Uh, he's That's awesome. He's, He's, um, he's, I mean, he's better than I am, or I was obviously at that age. I mean, he's in a lot better rides than I was at in at that age, but still like he, his race craft, his maturity on the track, off the track, like all that, he's really, really good. And, um, he can run harder than anybody on the racetrack and be in control. So, um, he's definitely the next kid coming up that probably will make it. What's he race? What is it? He oh, raced yeah. wing sprint cars. Oh, so, I'll be darned. Yeah. yeah, he won he, like he won an outlaw race. He won the gold cup this year at Chico. Uh he won an outlaw race. Um he'll be running with us uh on in our high limit series. So um I'm excited about that because yeah, the race fans are gonna get to you know, see some you know new young kid come up um that's probably gonna make it someday. So yeah, he he's that guy, but uh you know, I saw on Twitter all the you know I don't know, a month and a half ago. I, I don't think maybe you participated in it, but it was like a bunch of questions like who, you know, you had to answer the driver, like your favorite driver, who's the best driver you ever seen, all this and that. And, um, he, you know, Chris Rebell, he's, he's still like, he's the best that I get to race with um, on a weekly basis. And it's, it's sad that he doesn't get to run dirt anymore because he is so good. And uh, dirt racing needs, you know, 
him a part of it still. And, and I know he is with, you know, the ownership side with the sprint car a little bit on the development side and the micros and all that. But uh, I guess I'm happy that I don't have to race with him every weekend. Cause I can, you know, win a few more races, but uh, he's, he's really good. Um, you know, obviously Brad sweet, what he's doing Rico right now. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah. it's all fun. That's good stuff. So, um, you know, the fans would throw things at me if I didn't talk to you about the chili bowl. Uh, so, you know, there was a time there that I was going to the chili bowl every year and, uh, I know slamming Sammy Swindell and his son, uh, they were incredible, but, for me, the golden era of the Chili Bowl was you and Rico and, and Christopher Bell. I mean, when you guys were there, it was magical. And, you know, last lap passes. So do you ever see yourself going back to the Chili Bowl? Yeah, I think, I mean, for sure. I think I'll go back to the Chili Bowl um, someday. I, I just got to the point where, I don't know, I'd, done it literally half my life and I wasn't even 30 years old yet. So yeah, <laughs> I, kinda, I was kind of ready to do something different. Um, and you know, I, like I watched a ton of the shootout this past week. Watch me too. <laughs> I'll, watch, I'll watch every lap of the chili bowl. Like I still love the chili bowl. I just, I, I just am at a point in my life where I just needed to do something different. And um, in Vado was, you know, produces amazing racing and I really enjoy the dirt late model. So it's like, you know, that, that's a fun thing for me to get to go do. I can go run six races in, I don't know, 10 days or something. Um, where chili bowl, you're, you're there all week and you get to race twice. Um, although the chili bowl is way more fun because you get to be there with all your friends and all that. But, uh, again, I think I just grew out of the chili bowl for, you know, a little bit. You know, I wanted to win it so bad. I'd been so close to winning for so long. And even before I won, I always told everybody around me and they wouldn't believe me, but I was like, I'm going to run the chili bowl until I win. And then I'm going to run it until I lose. And when I lose, I'm going to be done. And, uh, that's, that's what I've done. So, um, but I, I'll definitely go back someday. I think is if Owen still continues to like racing and, and wants to you know move up the ladder, you know, in, in, you know, if he can go race the chili bowl someday, I'll, that's probably when I'll go back. Um, so we'll see. Um, yeah, I think next year I'd love to go to Australia and go race. Perth. Uh, yeah. Per I mean, anywhere really, but Perth looks, Perth looks awesome. I saw your tweet. You said you're making, basically you're making me want to go Rico. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brad and, and Rico and, um, Cal Wimson, they, they put on a phenomenal race. I don't know if you got to watch it, but, uh, yeah, so I want to go to Australia. It's it, and I've gone to Australia before. I've gone to New Zealand um, this time of year. Like it's fun. It's more than just racing. Whenever I've gone there, like it's it's really a vacation with racing that kind of helps pay for the vacation. So um, yeah, Paul Silva, he's trying to line it up right now. Like he's getting everything organized to ship there. We just kind of we we just got to find somewhere to like store everything. Um, you know, if there's a truck and trailer. Uh, that somebody can loan to us, you know, for the couple weeks that we would need it. Um, obviously it's expensive too. So, you know, we would need, we would love to have some support from a, a local company in Australia to, to help and promote them, um, to make you know, offset costs for us a little bit. Um, cause yeah, it's, it's a, it's tough. Like that's why there's not that many, if any team owners that send stuff there, uh, cause it's expensive. So, um, but, but I, I'm, yeah, I'll probably be in Australia next year. Just uh, we got to line some things out still. So having fun here, uh, like me and Schrader would say, let's say you wanted to go to Australia, but but now Rico's there and he's winning. Does that make you want to go more? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, no. it doesn't. I think what the, the winning part, I don't care about. Um, really? Yeah. No, I, but I think getting to go there with people who you have fun with and enjoy being around, I think that's what's – you know, like when I used to go to New Zealand, what made the trip fun for me was, you know, you, you build your relationships and your friendships there. Like I'm really good friends with Harley Taylor, who I was racing for there in New Zealand. But when I was going, it was Tyler Courtney, uh, Logan Seavey, Chris Windham, Spencer Baston, like all your all homeboys. My, yeah. All, all my homeboys. And, and <laughs> also I think that's what will make you go in Australia. If, if, if everybody goes to Perth again or, or wherever I end up going, you know, Rico, if he's there again, Brad would hopefully go. 
you know, Carson Macedo, I know he's talked about wanting to go and race there. Um, and it, hopefully, you know, maybe the races get even bigger there next year. Cause Australia is kind of confusing to me, you know, like there, it's such a big country and the tracks are all spread apart so far that, you know, there's a group of guys racing on the Eastern side of Australia and then a group on the Western side. Like if there was some big races where like everybody could get to, you know, the same track, I think that would make this, the, the racing really good. Obviously the fan base bigger, um, and, and just the overall experience more fun. So, um, we'll see kind of where, where it goes for next year, but, uh, yeah, I look forward to getting to hopefully go to Australia. Yeah, th- those battles at Perth have been unbelievable. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think Perth kind of looks like an Eldora with less banking. It, 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 or what do you think? Yeah, I, I haven't talked to like Brad or Rico, like what they feel it compares to. But the, the way it races, um, I feel like is a lot like Eldora. Um, to me, it looks it's definitely not a half mile, I don't think. So it's smaller than Eldora um, and less banking, but... Um. Yeah, I don't, I, racing. good racing. Yeah, great. And, and two, the track prep looks amazing. They look really efficient with their programs. Um, and two, like if I could go to Perth next year and race, like I want to race everything. I want to. I want to race a midget. I want to race a dirt late model. I want to race a mile. yes. They have all those racing on the same night. So um, that's what you know. I would want to do get get my money's worth going down there and racing. All right. We come to the very end, and all the drivers, uh, we've been very lucky here on Kenny Conversation to uh, talk with the best, and I'm very thankful that you're opening up 2024. Uh, I've always wanted to talk to you. Uh, So I always ask the drivers this at the end because NASCAR is so big. So uh, three things, Uh, your thoughts on the NASCAR today, what do you think of NASCAR today? Uh, I think there's a lot of negative people out there about yeah. where NASCAR is at today. Because I, I believe NASCAR is in a great spot. They're really, you know, thinking outside the box. I think for so long NASCAR just did the same thing year after year, um, where you know they're trying to shake up the schedule a lot, which I love. Um, even the next gen stuff is is, is a you know, kind of different business idea for the you know, sport and team owners and all that. So I feel like NASCAR more than they used to be or are much more forward thinking now. So um, I feel like teams, drivers, you know, the organization of NASCAR are all working together closer than they ever have. And, and that only means good things. So um, obviously every, every sport, maybe besides NFL, has seen a dip in audience, you know, whether it be at the sporting event or on TV. And that's just the way, you know, kind of life is right now. But I do feel like NASCAR has held their own much stronger than the other sports. So, um, yeah, I think they're doing a great job. They've got great people in place and, and I'm you know, proud to be you know, representing them on the racetrack. And the next one is your thoughts on this, when, well, we're going to go into our third year with the next gen car. This this car. The reason we ask this question, Kyle, this car changed NASCAR. We've never seen anything like it. Your thoughts on that car? Um, selfishly, you know, with being at Hendrick Motorsports, I would love for it to have stayed because yeah, <laughs> we're really fast, and you know, Hendrick was in 2020 and 21. But uh, no, I, I think. I think it's cool. I, I think the next gen stuff is fun. It's definitely a, a tougher race car to drive. Um, the style of racing has gotten way more, you know, elbows up and, and aggressive because the cars are way tougher. So you've had to adjust your driving style a fair bit. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's fun. So there's, you know, things that are worse or whatever you'd like to see better. Um, like the cars have more grip, uh, on the short tracks, the brakes are better, you know, so it's harder to pass, I would say at short tracks and road courses than it used to be, but the intermediate stuff, the mile and a half tracks are way more fun. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been enjoyable and I feel like Hendrick Motorsports has done a really good job too of, of learning the vehicle and, and developing and getting better. And, um, you had a great season Hendrick did this past year and, uh, came up a little bit short of the championship, but, uh, hopefully it'd be better you know, this year. 
And I think you're going to be the first driver that I'm going to get rid of the third question. Uh, in, two, that, in 2023, the third one we always ended was tech inspection. You know, the record-breaking $400,000 fines. But it seems like it seems like that's kind of subsided now. It, it seems to me like a, the teams have got the message. Um, maybe you will be the last driver I asked that question to. But... We'll ease out of it right now. Uh, tech inspection. I mean, it, it became record breaking with this new next gen car. Uh, what was your thoughts on that? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, it's gone. <laughs> into the technical side of it. So I, I don't know. And we're sitting here in the off season. So who knows what people have been developing. In mm, the off good point. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you'll always probably. You, you'll see, you'll probably, I would assume, see more fines and stuff coming uh, in the first few months of the season. And then, you know, once people kind of get their hands slapped and, and get scared, maybe they'll stop a little bit or, or they'll get better at cheating. But uh, I, I don't know. It's, um, it's tough. You know, everybody's cars are in essence the same. Um, so, you know, trying to find those areas to be a little bit better um, and, you know, pavement racers are always trying to push the envelope. So um, it just is what it is. And, and NASCAR is trying to crack down. So I, I respect that as well. Well, Kyle, you've been incredible. And I want to remind all the fans that we are in podcast form. We are showing up big time there more than normal now. And, you know, an hour and 20 minute conversation, that means you can listen to Kyle Larson on the way to work. And then you can work real fast and get excited because you get to listen to the rest of the Kyle Larson Kenny conversation on the way home. So check us out on iTunes, Spotify, and uh, Kyle, listen, do good down there in Vado. And I know race season starting here in a day or two. So uh, thank you so much for finally being on Kenny conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Kenny. I enjoyed it. I had a blast and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you at the racetrack soon. Thanks a lot. And all right, everybody, until the next one, we got some good ones lined up. I know Danica, Patrick, Kyle Bush, they're all coming on. So happy new year, everybody.